Thanks everyone for attending this panel discussion. This event is part of the culmination of an oral history project conducted by the University of Wyoming's American Heritage Center. My name is Leslie Wagner. I'm an archivist at the American Heritage Center and I'm the project director. The AHC, the American Heritage Center, is the UW's repository of manuscript collections, rare books, and university archives. And we house over 400 collections pertaining to um, the mining industry, oil, gas, wind, energy. But there's only a few collections that pertain to the community of effects, good and bad, that come with the development of these resources. And this project was conducted to add to that information. Along with some of my colleagues at the AHC, I put together a grant proposal in 2009 to the Wyoming Humanities Council to conduct oral history interviews with those involved in and impacted by activities to develop natural gas resources in Sublette County. And luckily for me, they said yes. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be standing here. <laughs> None of us would be here. Well, this past fall, October, November, four of us interviewed over 40 Sublette County residents, and not just Sublette County residents, but those outside of Sublette County, um, ranchers, town leaders, business owners, energy industry officials, gas field workers, social services personnel, trying to get at their viewpoints of, of some of the, the impact. Some of you may already know, those interviews can be found on the AHC's website at ahcuwyo.edu under the link Digital Collections. Well, this afternoon, what we're about with this panel discussion is we want to look at some various sides of the energy development that's happening in Sublette County. And we want to talk about the, the interviewees' experiences, particularly the experiences of our Sublette County panelists, who you're going to meet soon. And we want to place their experiences where we can into a more expansive state and national perspective. Because as you know, this is not the first boom, it's not the last boom, and it doesn't just happen in Wyoming. If there's time, we also want to talk about uh, what Wyoming citizens and officials can learn about dealing with future booms. But we do want to have some time for any questions that you have. And what, when that time comes, it'll be more towards the end of the program. I'm just going to ask anyone that has a question to come around this way, and then I'm going to give you the mic, because we are being filmed by UWTV, and I want to make sure your question um, gets asked by you in, in front of the camera. There's a few people I want to thank. Uh, Julia Stubel in the audience, uh, Mac Bluer, two UW graduate students who helped me greatly with research and transcript editing. I want to thank the, the three other interviewers, Rick Ewig, the American Heritage Center's Associate Director, Pinedale Historian Ann Noble, and Kim Winters, and Mark, the director, Mark Green, the director of the American Heritage Center for even allowing me to, <laughs> to, to do such a project as, it, as this that is a pretty ambitious project. Also, I want to thank our funders, the Wyoming Humanities Council and the UW School for Energy Resources. SER is actually paying for the filming of this panel discussion, as well as another one happening in Pinedale on May 16th. And of course, many thanks to the people that we interviewed for this project. Now what I'd like to do is give the mic to former state, Wyoming state historian, Dr. Dr. David Kafka, who will introduce the panelists and he will be our, the moderator for the discussion. Thank you, Leslie. Today, we're examining uh, one of Wyoming's most recent energy booms, the natural gas development in Sublette County. And before we begin, I'd like to provide, as an historian, some historical perspective. I'll keep that short. 
Um, this is not, most of you probably know, the first boom that we've had in, in Wyoming. If we go back many years, the fur trade may give us the first example of a boom that we had in here since, at least since uh, Anglo-European settlement began in Wyoming. Gold mining, uh, anybody here at South Pass? <laughs> um, open range cattle industry, another example of a boom. The coming of the Union Pacific Railroad. Maybe this university wouldn't have been here if it hadn't been for the coming of the Union Pacific Railroad. Underground coal mining, another boom. Oil production at the turn of the century. Uranium production. Who knows what's going to happen to uranium production right now. Coal mining, strip mining, and natural gas production. As historians have looked back at these, they've discovered some similarities, and it might help to think about some of these as we listen to our panelists. Booms include, most of the time, a rapid economic expansion based on the production and marketing of one commodity, and they therefore are vulnerable to change. The fur trade came about because of a change in fashion and disappeared because of a change in fashion. Gold mining was subject to the price of the, the metal, and then ultimately, again, first to the high price and then to the low price of the metal. Open range cattle industry boomed because of free grass. Not the kind maybe some of you are thinking about. <laughs> uh, and overgrazing combined with weather destroyed it. Coal mining boomed in part in terms of the strip mining when the Clean Air Act was passed. Some of you who like to blast on the federal government might remember that the uh, Senator Simpson was very instrumental in making sure that low sulfur coal was not subject to the same kinds of restrictions in terms of cleaning the air that other coal from other parts of the world was subject to, and it uh, certainly contributed to the boom. Uh, natural gas uh, booms in part because of, of the price, and we've, we've already seen that the price fluctuates in natural grass, gas. And then uranium boom because of the desire to have, quote unquote, a cleaner energy. Uh, and we don't know right now whether this current possible boom in, in uranium is going to, to change. In Sweetwater County, we're watching that very carefully uh, because we have uranium mines in the northeastern corner. Economic booms have also usually been viewed by different populations differently. The term boom, if you aren't involved in it, generally means something pretty good for your state and has for Wyoming. But the people who are involved in it sometimes have mixed feelings about the booms. Uh, for example, the economic benefits uh, to the indigenous populations during the fur trade, they might look at that boom as a little bit, a little bit differently than the European settlements, although there were a lot of positive things they were getting out of that too. The ultimate long term wasn't so great. Uh, some people will ask if the economic benefits derived from a boom are worth the social dislocations that happen with the boom. What lessons we learn from the booms might help us in the future prepare better for other booms to come. And we hope that uh, our panelists and our commentators uh, will provide us with that, that information. Uh, let me introduce, give you a brief introduction of the panelists. I'm going to introduce all of the panelists initially and then uh, they will speak individually in the order that I introduce them. Callie McKee is a longtime Pinedale resident and regional manager. Uh, we talked about the, her title as an example of people wear many hats in Wyoming. She's a regional manager of safety, health, and regulation for ultra, ultra resources. And Callie works in Pinedale's uh, Ultras Pinedale's office, Ultras Pinedale office. Leslie Rozier is a former, uh, is a third generation, ran from a third generation ranching family in the Pinedale area and a Sublette County nurse practitioner. 
She has deep roots in Wyoming. Ward Wise is a Pinedale native, former Pinedale mayor's assistant, uh, March of 2004 to April of 2005, a former member of Pinedale School Board, 2005 to 2008, and owner, owner of Pinedale-based Wise Communications. Dr. Greg Cauley is a UW political science professor since 1987. Uh, he's written a book about the Sage Brush Rebellion and has a real interest in clashes with the federal government. Dr. Donna Barnes is associate professor and head of the UW Sociology Department and is particularly interested in social movements. We're going to begin our discussion today with Callie. Each of the panelists will give us about a five minute presentation. They will then talk amongst themselves, ask questions amongst themselves, then we'll open it to the audience. Good afternoon. This is what happens when you arrive last. You have to go first. So I should have left town earlier this morning. Um, so just, I guess maybe just to start with a little of my background and how I ended up where I am. And um, for me, working in the oil and gas business wasn't necessarily a, a planned profession. Um, I was home in Pinedale working as a um, hostess at Lakeside Lodge, if any of you have been there. And I thought I had a pretty good job. Um, I was going to graduate school and a friend of the family called me up and said, do you want to help me open an office in Pinedale for Ultra Petroleum? And I was kind of like, eh, I really like hostessing, you know. Um, I like the people, and I don't like waiting tables, but I like chit-chatting. And I said, well, I don't know, what does it pay? And I think at the time it paid like $7 an hour, which was more than hostessing. And uh, I said, well, okay. So that's how I got into the oil and gas business. Um, I was in the graduate school here at the University of Wyoming for natural resource management, I think, um, never finished. So I opened an office, helped um, this gentleman open an office in uh, Pinedale for Ultra Petroleum, and I've kind of made the rounds since then. I've been to other companies and been back and been to Denver and moved home. So I've been back in Pinedale, um, gosh, I, I think almost 10 years now. I have twin boys who are graduating from high school this year. And uh, I guess from my perspective, you know, the, the growth and the change that we've seen in Pinedale since I moved there in seventh grade, so I would have been like 12, um, has been significant. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a different community when you look at, at, at what we look like now and what we looked like 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. Um, I made a note in here that something that Leslie told me, you know, that I hear people complain, well, I can't make a left turn on Main Street anymore without waiting like two minutes. Um, so I think it's a lot of interesting perspective from small town life about what we think are like major changes and, um, you know, big impositions on our time and what, what might be a, um, a level of significance if you come from Denver or maybe even Laramie. But um, it's, it's definitely different uh, having basically grown up there and then raised my kids there. So um, it is an industry I enjoy. It is an industry I'm proud to work for and see some of the things that they've brought to Pinedale and brought to the community, uh, the way they do their business. So I look forward to talking about all of that tonight. Thanks. Okay. Leslie. Hi, my name is Leslie Rozier, and uh, I come from a small town of Pinedale. We both come from, <laughs> all of us come from the small town of Pinedale. I, earlier, I was looking at the wonderful photograph of Fremont Lake on a pre-dawn morning, the panorama, as you look across the Mesa Breaks and you see all the lights and all the rigs. And I think one of the things that brings um, us together, and uh, particularly Ward and Callie, we have one thing in common, and one of our elders of the community was very insightful, saying, we have this huge lake, we must do something exciting on the lake. And so he brought sailing to Fremont Lake over 35 years ago. So one thing that we share in common is we've all sailed on the same boat, but we've also sailed on different boats, and we've all competed against each other. And one of the, the lessons I would have um, people learn is that we can be friends, we can be mentors, we can sail together, but we also know how to race against each other, and we have that competitive edge. But we all bring to the table different strengths, different wishes, and even though we all live there, we work together, um, we are friends, but it, there are meetings when we're about ready to kill each other. So you have to work together, and you do so as a team. And um, sailing, 
and like I say, brings all of us together. And when I look at that picture of Fremont Lake and thinking of Callie being a hostess at Fremont Lake at the Lakeside Lodge, I also think of, of um, an old story, and I can do this to Ward, he'll be okay. Um, as a small child, taking sand from Sandy Beach and dropping it in the console of his dad's Thunderbird, and his mother going, oh my god, you know, what would this child do? So I come to the table having been a, a uh, I come from a third generation family ranch. Uh, my grandfather uh, picked up this ranch from Mr. Geller, who was a Union Pacific man. Three men came to Suffolk County from the Union Pacific, and they homesteaded the ranches on the New Fork River south of Pinedale. Unfortunately for me, this latest boom is a very bittersweet message because my family ranch has been significantly impacted by the development. Uh, we chose not to renew our leases. Um, we chose to be fairly verbal about the New Fork River, about the Mesa Breaks, and it's very difficult when you're speaking to um, people who have the leases on the Anticline or the Mesa because my entire childhood, that mesa was a critical wildlife habitat area, and I could not even cross-country ski on that mesa, and now there's a paved road with multiple sites in that area. However, the bittersweet. I have a fabulous job in a beautiful state-of-the-art clinic with a CAT scan. I have helicopters in my backyard flying out patients on a daily basis, and my pockets are full of cash. So it is a bittersweet moment for me to see my hometown uh, through the, uh, not only one boom, but several booms. And um, I think we have many lessons to learn about that. But part of that is working together, making sure that the dialogue is among friends and um, among people who are well-educated. So I welcome your questions, and it is my joy and privilege to be here to talk about the lessons that we can learn. Thank you, Leslie. I also want to say thank you, Leslie Wagner, for orchestrating this. And it's an honor to be here. Thank you all for coming. You know, it's funny, we're telling a little bit about where we came from before we got involved in this. And I, I was in Sydney, Australia, where I was head of investor services for TD Waterhouse Australia for two years. And I thought, well, it's time to come back to Wyoming. And uh, so I come back in December, of course, the middle of winter. And Rose Skinner, who was the mayor at that time, he was known me ever since I was six months old, probably says, you may be able to help us out a little bit. And I said, oh, what's going on? And she said, well, we've got this development. We need somebody in my office to help kind of tie this together and tell us what we need to do and get us started on some things. And infrastructure was what she was concerned with. The town provides things that individuals can't provide for themselves, which is water and sewer and police and fire, medical. <clears throat> well, the county takes care of our our sheriff department. We don't have a town police department. It's all done through the county. We have the county rural care health district. Seemed pretty simple enough, right? Kind of look at what you need and go from there. And then all of a sudden, all these issues start bubbling up. So the first place we start is, well, who's who's got some expertise in this field of infrastructure? <coughs> and we had a town engineer and. The town had been pretty progressive about developing their infrastructure with their water lines and sewer lines. And uh, it became pretty apparent that we were in pretty good shape for water with our distribution system, but our sewer was another concern. Well, here's this population, this anticipated population coming, but we don't know how many. So how can you build a sewer lagoon size if you don't know how many it's going to fill? So, I put a call into the Industrial Site Council for Wyoming. Large projects such as coal plants, coal mining, fall before the Wyoming Industrial Site Council. Which kind of orchestrates that procedure. Oil and gas is exempt from the Industrial Site Council. So we're kind of on our own. So it was rather unique to, to come back and all of a sudden here's this plane, for lack of a better word, starting to take off. And the first order of business was, where are we at with our infrastructure? Our, our roads that were being used by trucks were, were not built to those specifications. Our distribution lines and our sewer were 40-year-old clay pipes. We had run cameras down to see how much water was seeping in and reaching the lagoon and things like that. So 
that was the focus to begin with, um, was the distribution from our sewer lines and, and the infrastructure of the town. And uh, all of a sudden, you've got property, private property rights issues that are coming into play. Uh, my neighbor's doing something next door to me, can they really do that? Uh, my sewer rates are this amount. <laughs> You're telling me we're going to increase the sewer rates to build a new sewer lagoon, but yet I didn't cause that, so why should my rates go up? Shouldn't the new growth have to pay for that? So all of a sudden, we get caught up in all this, these issues that are actually tugging at the community fabric. And uh, again, this is just from my perspective as the mayor's assistant with the town. And again, these issues fall over into the school system as well with the population. Um, the biggest difference that I see in this growth that we weren't accustomed to was the demographics of the new population that was coming in. It was a younger crowd, um, younger children, and kind of a tougher crowd. You had a lot of uh, support services that support the gas field. And that's where a lot of these issues that suddenly came to the forefront um, or right in our lap. And then you couple that with the national energy policy debate that's going on, and all of a sudden, Pineville, Wyoming is on the news. It seemed like nightly. I don't think it was, but it certainly was, was often. If it wasn't ABC or NBC, it was Fox or the Drudge Report or NPR. And you know, here we are trying to sort our own community out. So it was uh, <clears throat> seemed like an easy task at first that um, I suddenly realized had a lot to it. Um, the planning and zoning board um, for the town is an advisory board, and one of my duties was to to uh, facilitate that board as all the building applications came in through my desk. And uh, it was just amazing where these these city council people and, and people who volunteer in their time to be on these boards. You know, a couple of years ago, they might see an a application for a new house and a, an enclosure in a garage and maybe a fence. And all of a sudden, they were being presented with a 100-unit motel, um, annexation of 200 acres, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so it was a lot to ask uh, of, our, of our elected officials and those volunteers. So we had a lot of catching up to do. The state was very good, Governor Friedenthal, and I'm a Republican, just to let you know. But, but I'm going to say that because he was very instrumental in helping us. Uh, we had to go to the SLED board, the State Land Investment Board, and obtain grants to build the sewer lagoon and, and things of this nature. And uh, I, I love what I love about the state of Wyoming is you can pick up the phone and usually get to the person you need to get to. And it uh, made a big difference. I think from a school perspective, the thing that saved us was our excess recapture money, which became a, a big topic, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, that's no longer in place. That was taken away. And I think that uh, without that, we would have been in some serious trouble. As it was, we had those funds. We, we were able to build some additions onto some schools while we were trying to get the pieces together of how much of an impact the population was going to bring. And there was a crowd that said, you know what, if we, if we have a building moratorium, then we don't, we don't have all these issues. And, we'll, and a, a person actually ran for county commissioner, and that was part of their platform. And of course, they were defeated. But it's funny that everybody, depending on your perspective of where you were at in life and your situation, if your compensation was tied to the industry, directly or indirectly, and where you were at, you were forming an opinion about some of these issues. And of course, over time, your opinion may change as well. But there was a lot going on within the community, as Leslie was alluding to, where dialogue, she, she kept using the term dialogue, and absolutely, we had to have a lot of dialogue to hold this community together. Um, it was not uncommon to be at a planning and zoning board meeting and have the developer there with two attorneys sitting next to him, as well as the national media waiting to talk to you after the meeting. So those were kind of the things that were happening in a small town. Thank you. Dr. Foley. <coughs> well, <coughs> pardon me. I've got sinus issues. Well, 
I guess I'm on the panel for a couple of different reasons, but my specific connection is that in the mid-70s, I worked in uh, Governor Dick Lamb of Colorado's office. And some of you may recall in the 70s, we had another energy crisis, and all eyes turned west. And so the primary project I worked on was energy impact assistance to provide funds for local communities that were going to be impacted by energy development out here. So Dave's right, not new. I mean, many of the issues we're talking about now, pretty much the same. Right. Infrastructure, that's how I learned the word infrastructure, was working in the governor's office. I don't know how many times I wrote that word. <laughs> Turns out, there are some differences here, though, politically. One of the things that was different about what was going on out here in the mid-70s as opposed to what's going on now is an attempt to make energy development in the West into a regional issue. And it turns out Dick Lamb in Colorado and this fellow, maybe some of you remember, Gov Ed Herschler here in Wyoming were the two lead governors. Their notion was that it was a regional problem and so what they were trying to do is bring, working through the governors, is to bring the governors of the Rocky Mountain states primarily together to form a unified front in dealing with the federal government. Part of it had to do with, of course, understanding that if the states are arguing with each other, that's not going to be helpful. The other part, of course, had to do also with something more pragmatic, and that is, well, you know, the state of New York has more votes in the United States Congress than the entire Intermountain West. And so there's a certain kind of unevenness in, in the playing field. I work specifically for Governor Lamb's assist, assistant for natural resources, a guy named Jim uh, Monahan. I got to know the state planning coordinator from the state of Wyoming, who was the lead for the state of Wyoming. Somebody, maybe some of you have heard of, a young fellow by the name of Dave Friedenthal. Right. So Governor Friedenthal's front end help in the current controversy, I think, is pretty explainable because he's been through all this before. The basic issue back in the 70s, and it sounds like it's still the same issue today, was, okay, growth is coming. How do we plan for it? How do we prepare for it? And the position of the Western governors in those days was that the federal government should provide assistance to the front end. So that various local communities like Pinedale, got to put in a footnote here, Back in those days, the county in Wyoming that was getting all the attention was Sweetwater County, which is where it was going. I remember one day sitting at my desk in the governor's office thinking about all this stuff, looking at all the studies that had been done of Sweetwater County, and I had this strange sensation that maybe what had happened here is this huge influx of pardon me, Donna, sociologists coming in to study the impacts of what you really had going on in Stillwater County was sociologists interviewing sociologists. You know, um, but the position of the governors was that the federal government should provide front-end assistance so that you can build your lagoons, build your water system, build your schools, hospitals, what have you. So that's all in place by the time the population moves in. Not surprisingly, the position of the federal government was, well, but wait a minute, if we give you all that money up front, then when those people move in, what you're going to get is essentially a windfall in terms of all the new tax revenue that these people will bring in with them. So the federal government's position was, well, you know, you should just wait until the people come, 
don't bring the taxes, then you can build. Okay? Went around and around and around and ultimately got nowhere. Okay? And of course what happened is the boom, at least at the scale that we were talking about in the mid-70s, simply didn't come about. Okay? We have some monuments to those days not far from here in Laramie, I think. Um, we have a rather solid physical plant school in Medicine Bow that's no longer a school. Um, we have another one in Rock River. Okay. Both of those schools were the product of, in, in this case, the predicted boom in the basin uh, for uranium that never materialized. Okay. The state of Wyoming, of course, came up with the Industrial Siting Act, which was you know, all set. Viewed one way as sort of legalized extortion. I mean, basically, what happens here is we have the siting, the industrial siting, which covers a lot of the energy development. The companies come in, local communities present the companies with a wish list okay, of infrastructure needs, um, and the industry either builds the infrastructure and gets their permit or doesn't build infrastructure and don't get their permit. I have some Sicilian blood on one side of my family. So. <laughs> now, relatives I don't talk much about, but they understand that kind of a business, right? But the boom didn't come, and that's another problem with all of this. And Pinedale, of course, we've already got a lot of development there. Estimates I've seen is the development so far is not nearly as great as some of the estimates some time ago. But nevertheless, right, these things come and go. I mean, look at uranium. Right? Um, all my, well, not all, quite a few of my environmental friends, for instance, um, have told me in, oh, within the last year and a half, that they have fundamentally changed their position on nuclear power. Why? Well, because of this little thing called global climate change. What they have decided is that in terms of being able to supply the kind of energy that we need as a society and avoid global climate change, actually nukes are the best available technology available. And then suddenly we have Japan. Okay. Still hard to see what's going to happen here, but suddenly now there's a lot more nervousness about nuclear power plants than there was six months ago. Okay. Which is really a problem, I think, for planning, for preparing out here in the West. Okay. Yeah, we have boom and bust cycles. But, but at the same time, we don't know exactly how they're going to happen, when they're going to happen. We have demographics. As an aside, I'm working on a different project, but I came across a, a federal government document published in 1933, a committee uh, created by then President Herbert Hoover, looking at social trends of the future. The first chapter of this document is population. The, it, the report was put together by a, 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 a panel of experts. Right. First chapter on population predicts declining population growth in the United States. In fact, predicted that by 1970, the population of the United States would actually begin to go into what we now call negative growth. Right also predicted that the population was going to get older. By the 1950s, there's going to be a 50% increase in the number of people in our society 65 years or older. This is 1933. What they didn't predict, of course, was the baby boom. I use this as an example of my class sometimes because I take it quite personally. It gives me a certain kind of identity crisis See, on the basis of the 1933 study, I am the solution to the problem. On the basis of 1960, <coughs> I am the problem. <laughs> but 
But in a sense, I'm being playful here. But in a sense, I think that captures what, what we've got going with all of this energy development, right? I mean, the argument is, who, who, you know, what's the problem, what's the solution, right? And, and as you rightly pointed out, all three of you pointed out, you've got all sorts of different perspectives. I want to make <coughs> two last kind of broad points, and then I'll be quiet. Change. I think change is a fascinating political topic in our society. On the one hand, we have all sorts of people who have gotten tenure and promotion right, at universities writing wonderful treatises about how Americans are resistant to change right, and how we resist change all the time. But at the same time, I want to submit to you that we live in a society that prepares people for change probably better than any other society on this planet. I have enough gray hair now that I can speak with authority that the society I live in today is radically different than the society I lived in when I was 20 years old, and even more radically different than the society I lived in when I was 10 years old. Now, I've participated in some of the change that's occurred in society, but a lot of the change was thrust upon me. Yet, I don't set up at night worrying about this change. I mean, I've adopted my life, as just about everybody in our society has. So I think there's that tension there. We say, oh, we don't want change, and then we pull out our Blackberry with absence, right? And start poking away. I don't have one. By the way, I do draw some lines. But I did just get a new computer and it's driving me crazy trying to get organized. But I think that's one thing we need to talk about, is we do have this ambivalence. On the one hand, we say see change is, change is bad, but on the other hand, we accept change on a regular basis, right down in our individual lives. A new report comes out, <coughs> caffeine's bad for you, everybody gives up coffee. Another report comes out and says, well, decaf is bad for you, and so, you know, we go around and around. Right? But we make those changes on an individual level. Related to that, planning. Right? Because planning is, is useful. But planning makes most, well, my colleague Bill Grips here, so I have to be careful. Right? Planning is very much like mystery novels. See, mystery novels make a lot more sense when you know what the end is. When you get to the end of the novel, then you can go back and look at all of the clues that were in the novel that led up to the conclusion. Unfortunately, the real world is such that we never know exactly what the end is. So we have all sorts of folks who claim to be authorities and experts and make predictions <coughs> 1930s, right? But then the novel moves in a completely different direction. You think about the hoopla after 9-11. All the folks, the conspiracy folks who talked to us about how the intelligence community had all the information and they just didn't act upon it. Well, I'm pretty sure our intelligence community had that kind of information, but the problem is they didn't know how the story was going to end. Right? So if you don't know how the story is going to end, you don't know which of the facts or whatever are the important ones and which are the unimportant ones. Mm -hmm. Last anecdote in that regard, and I'll shut up. I started graduate school in Fort Collins in 1971. And there were all sorts of folks in 1971 who created wonderful scenarios of what the city of Fort Collins was going to look like if the city council didn't adopt stringent planning, zoning, what have you. Before I go farther, any farther, yes, I'm going to contradict myself here, but stay with me. And I used to go to various city meetings and see charts and graphs and, and images of what Fort Collins was going to look like. Turns out they were right, because the city of Fort Collins today looks pretty much like what they were said it was going to look like back in the early 70s, and by the way, the city council did not adopt 
much in the way of stringent zoning and, and planning. But it just reinforces my point. Sometimes you can look ahead and see things. Other times you can look ahead and not see anything but mud. I'll be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. My interest in this energy movement project came through my research interest in social movements, particularly grassroots social movements that emerge in communities of various sizes when they're confronted with some type of challenge. And um, all social movements at the grassroots level, when they're getting off the ground, face what sociologists call the fr a framing challenge, and that is you've got to convince a contingent, at least enough people, that your movement's viable, that there's a serious grievance that merits them giving time, energy, possibly money, to trying to address some type of happening or change that's occurring in the community. And typically, when you start getting that organizing, you'll get counter-organizing, where people don't like what you're saying. And I saw this happen again and again in different social movements I've looked at from the 1800s all the way up to the contemporary time period. And you see it in Sublet County, where you get some of the kind of total open arms, drill baby drill mentality, where some might say a fairly mindless welcoming of the industry. Others move a little bit more away from that and say, well, we know there's good and bad, but we're going to try to mitigate um, some of the worst effects and try to get as much good out of this as possible, because this is going to happen. Um, others, moving further along uh, the perspective, will say, well, we're going to try to push harder on mitigation than these other folks seem to be willing to go, even if we're labeled troublemakers, because we don't think they're moving significant enough, fast enough, and then still others say, we don't want any development at all, so don't even talk to us about mitigation, we want to stop it. So you get all these different uh, spectrum uh, uh, opinions uh, along the spectrum, and sometimes they put family members against family members, neighbors against neighbors, and what used to be a nice community becomes really very tension-oriented. Even in the social movement, um, sector, you might get different organizations with very different opinions. I found it interesting that Linda Baker, in her oral history for this project, uh, she um, started the um, Upper Green River Valley Coalition, now the Alliance, but she talked about the first protest that she remembered where they had framed it as stop development, not mitigate it, but just stop it. And their strategizing was that they chained the front door of the BLM office shut, got guitars, and started singing in the foyer, and basically occupied this building. Well, she said some of the locals, even though they were concerned about um, the oil and gas development, this didn't sit well with them. This was not the kind of strategizing that they wanted. So she said that created difficulty for her in trying to say, well, we're not going to go down that path. Because some people immediately, oh, these are the kind of environmentalists that we certainly don't even want to talk to. And then she says sometimes things, resistance comes from totally different um, areas. Like there's a lot of complicating factors that occurred with reintroduction of wolves, where some people were so upset by that, they just painted the whole environmental movement as something that they was anti-ranching. So if they were a ranching family, they didn't want to have anything to do um, with anything labeled conservationist or environmental. So you had all these tensions in the community that had to uh, be managed. You had to decide well, where did you stand on the development. And also, if you opposed it or wanted to mitigate it, uh, to what extent were you willing to get involved and in what way. And what I found most interesting about the oral histories is some of the thread of uh, positions that ran through people of very diverse backgrounds saying fairly similar things. Like Cal, who was a senior regulatory coordinator, was saying things that resonated with what Linda Baker was saying, who was um, some saw as oppositional. 
but she saw herself as not totally oppositional, but just wanting to mitigate. In fact, she had pretty negative things to say about Earth First, which is, um, was the one coordinating that first sit-in. And she said they were pretty young, they really had no idea what they were saying or doing. Um, they just were here to make noise. So you even had environmental groups turning on other environmental groups saying basically shut up. You're not making the situation any better. You're complicating our lives. So you had all of these going on. Um, she said her most difficult challenge was trying to convince uh, people that the desert wasn't a wasteland to be just ignored. She said some people were saying, well, that's the desert. We don't care what happens on the desert. Just protect our mountains. But so they had to actually, that was one of their big campaigns, to try to uh, educate people that the desert actually is, in the view of her organization, extremely important to wildlife survival during the winter. And if you care about wildlife, you've got to care about the desert. So she said she was shocked sometimes to hear people saying, well, who cares about the desert? They can put all the wells they want out there. After all, it's just the desert. So any social movement organization has got to decide um, how, is your, how are you going to convince the community about what the problems are, what problems to put the highest priority on mitigating, and um, how to go about doing that. And as many of you might know, a few times this past March, uh, the ozone alerts in the Pine Dell area were higher than they had been, I think I read one place, historically in LA. So um, again, trying to draw people's attention to um, the issues and, okay, we've got development, but surely we can um, alleviate it to a, a mitigate it to a certain extent so that we're not getting ozone alerts, the equivalent of the LA area. And so talking about not just are we gonna drill or not drill, but move it away more to a discussion of the pace of drilling, how many leases at any given moment in time. And they said you make a lot more progress when you do that than when you uh, try to frame it as accepting oil development or no oil development. And I was surprised in her interview, and it was repeated, I think, by both Ward and Callie. Um, she said, one thing I've learned, and that is you don't get very far with, at least in this area, um, by totally trying to villainize the oil and gas industry. She said, most people heat their homes, need oil and gas for transportation. It's used to produce the food you eat. Um, she said to be totally oppositional um, is really kind of Don Quixote-like, um, you know, uh, uh, fighting uh, the inevitable. So she, her organization has tried to argue, we just need to think more sensibly, bring everybody to the table. Um, people who grew up in this area, no one wants to see it burned. And we just simply have to decide what are reasonable things to do to mitigate it. And of course, even when you think you're being reasonable, I'm sure you've experienced this, others don't think you're being reasonable. Like, you think that's reasonable? But those are the kind of things that basically social movement organizing always involves. Trying to define what is reasonable and to get enough consensus that the community can um, build on that. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to do is, is allow the the panelists to ask any questions or make any further comments they want uh, first or and our other commentators to ask questions of the panelists. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple questions of the panelists. One of the questions that I'd like to ask Callie, uh, you are, I think you're, <laughs> uh, you are the face of one of the large, there are three large corporations that are really known for the work they're doing up there, correct? Uh, Ultra, Shell, and Questar, mm -hmm. is that correct? Uh, what, what do you think is the biggest problem in developing this uh, product uh, for a large company like Ultra? And oh, why don't you com do the comparison between Ultra and Shell and Questar in terms of the, of the size of them and so forth? Because I remember you had some things to say about Ultra and how it differed from some of the others. Right. Well, I guess I might start, start with that. I said this to the other panelists earlier, um, although I do work for Ultra, I've worked for Indiana, uh, which is one of the largest producers down in Jonah. Um, 
speaking tonight from my own personal experience and personal opinion and not representing the companies. But I think what I did reference in my interview was that um, companies inherently have their own culture and their own kind of way they, they operate and they interact. And um, Ultrashell and QEP have an interesting kind of um, collaboration, if you will, on the development of the anticline. Um, although, in many ways, we, well, it, we are still competitors. Um, and so, we do have a different take a lot of times on, on how we approach things, whether it's community relations, community investment, um, PR, uh, how we communicate with the media, whether we communicate with the media. Um, all these companies have different kind of internal uh, cultures as to how they handle those things. Um, I forget where you started. What, well, uh, what is the biggest problem for you as a well, I mean, is it, is it, for example, working with these other companies, or is it dealing with some of the problems that other people have talked about? I don't about? know that it's so easy as to pull out one thing and say it's the okay. biggest problem. Um, I, I mean, there are obviously a, any number of challenges, whether it's working with other companies or working with community members or working with the federal government and the BLM um, or working with environmental or NGOs or whatever you want to call them, conservation groups. I mean, there are a lot of people who are interested in what's happening, who have a vested interest and a vested concern in what's going on in their community and you really have to, um, I think, talk to and deal with all of those things. As far as being like the face of Ultra, and I think I talked to Leslie about this, I spent a lot of time kind of being the face of Encana when I worked there for five years also um, in the community. And in some ways, uh, in some ways it is a privilege for me, in some ways it is a burden to carry, if you will. I've spent some time trying not to be the face of Ultra. Um, because in a small community it can be very challenging, I think. Uh, you tend to know all the people who are with you, against you, or, you know, don't care. Um, and you don't just see them in a public meeting, you see them at church, you see them in a grocery store, you see them on the, I sit on the Pinedale Fine Arts Council with them, or I sit on the chamber board with them, or, you know, I see them at my parent-teacher conferences at school. So, um, it is not so easy to separate what goes on in your professional life from what goes on in your private life in a community like Pinedale, and I think probably in any community <coughs> in Wyoming, because they're all kind of <coughs> small towns. So, you know, it is, it is a challenge, and I think it, it takes a significant amount of courage, whether it's on the professional side or on the, the private side, or representing a business or representing yourself, to stand up in a small town and take a position, because you can't, you can't leave it at the door and then go do something else. You have to own it all the time. Do you want to answer that? Do you have a different question? Well, let somebody else. Donna, do you, want to, do you have a question for anyone of the panelists? No, not today. Let, let me, if, if I may, oh, you may, tell a funny story about Callie. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have to tell one about you. Yeah. <laughs> Just a minute, you too. <laughs> and about relationships that she's alluding to in a small town. Um, I think it was my third month there. I think it was April or May. And, and our library is across that infamous Main Street that, that you couldn't cross in the morning because of all the traffic. And, and we, our school, our elementary school's north about five blocks from that library. And we really didn't have a sidewalk there. So the kids would just walk along the street. And I'm like, no, that's not a very good thing. And so when the town did the budget, we thought we'd have enough to put this sidewalk in. Well, we came up a little short. So I thought, you know, if I can't raise, you know, $50,000 short. I, if I can't get fifty thousand dollars out of Shell and Ultra and Canada, then I, you know, I'm not worth my weight at this desk. I was having trouble until I called Cal. Yeah, I think we can, we can do something with that. And two hours later, yeah, it's done. Thanks. So she was really instrumental in tying a lot of that together and, and coordinating with the other players in the industry. And that totally invaluable to the community. She did a great service with that. Let me comment on that too. I mean, in in, in the, the current context, of course, right, we, we do have large corporate entities affecting us out here in the West. But I think it's important to remember, and Dave and I were talking about this uh, just before the panel started, 
the West as we know it has largely been shaped by industry. In fact, if you were listening close to Dave's opening comment, there he, he used a term that, that's, I think, a very important term. He talked about the livestock industry. Okay? And, and this is an ongoing battle out here in the West. Okay? Uh, all sorts of folks in the early days didn't see stock growing as an agricultural activity. It was an industrial activity. Producing livestock for us out here in the West? No. Right. To fuel markets back East. The fur trade right. is largely another industrial activity. So, I mean, if you stand back and look at it that way, then, you know, the West, you know, kind of the rural West versus corporate America and what have you, it's kind of hard to find where those, those boundaries are. Right. I mean, you know, it's getting. Not Leslie, not, not to pick on you, but one of the things that really helped the livestock industry out here in the West were all those rich absentee landlords who bought up big chunks of land out here, a lot of them British, yeah, and allowed people out here in the West to play cowboy, which they wouldn't have been able to do if, if that kind of industrial capital had been, been provided. So I think there, I guess what I'm trying to make is, is, I think it might be good to kind of not move in the direction of us against industry, or at least put it in a broader historical, that, that though we like to think for ourselves out here in the West, rugged individuals, cowboys, what have you, most of the world of the West as we know it has been short, shaped, given shape by corporate America. Let's say, I was interested in your comment about this being bittersweet, and I think we're kind of going in that direction there too. But uh, as, as a medical provider, what were the challenges for you in trying to, you know, first of all, you're in a small community that has challenges in providing 20th, 21st century medicine anyway, but when you, you have this sudden impact, what, what are the challenges? Tell us a little bit about what it was like being a medical provider in that situation. Well, I'm actually old enough to have gone through two boom and bust periods. And back in the 1970s, um, we had, well, it's many of the, the boom and bust. But you had a community, and Sutlet County um, historically has had gas development in the south, or the southern end of the county. Growing up in high school, there are individuals in this room that had the benefit of being in Sutlet County with great schools, we had great resources. Very few of us realized as students at that time that it actually was coming from the gas severance taxes. So those of us sitting here grew up with some of that resource, but it wasn't in our face. And as the developments incurred over time, we, we started to see the blue collar worker, the, the worker bees coming into the community, and all of a sudden the face of Pinedale, the recreational gateway to the Windermere Mountains and to Fremont Lake and, and all of the the recreational agricultural world, it began to shift. And during that first period, I was working with Dr. Johnson in the old Pinedale Medical Clinic, and we had difficulty providing care to all the, the workers. We were looking at a man camp in Big Piney. Dr. Burnett was down in the Big Piney Clinic. Dr. Johnson and I were up in the Pinedale Clinic. And these individuals were working 12 to 18 hour days, and they would be bused down to Shoot Creek, and they would be bused down into Lincoln County, but because they were making so much money during the day, they didn't want to miss their work. And so they would call us at midnight when they got home to Pinedale and say, I want to meet you at the emergency room because I have a cold. And you're like, you're crazy. You know, I'm not going to get up at midnight, to, but this happened night upon night upon night. So you, you had a cranky doctor who had to be in the clinic from 8 till 5 during working hours. But we were trying to cover that after our call, and just the, the strain on the little medical systems was huge. So that was, you know, once again, Doc was making money. I was really cranky. That's the part of that bittersweet. Then the last boom, we had more time to anticipate those changes. We knew, I mean, the rural health care district in Sutlet County is not a hospital district. Many years ago in the 1970s, we developed the Rural Healthcare District, and that was a district to create monies to build these clinics in Suffolk County. And in this recent boom, both Big Piney Marbleton and Pinedale have brand new multi-million dollar clinics 
they are fully staffed, and they anticipated some of the need of what was happening on, in the Jonah and in the Anacoy. Unfortunately, the bittersweet for me is we've lost the old country doctor environment. We no, we no longer know our patients ultimately. We lose them to follow up. Uh, we still see the very major challenges that industry and a new influx of individuals coming to Summit County, what that brings. Alcohol has always been present in Wyoming. It's the drug choice, single car rollovers. But that has increased exponentially because the traffic 191 between Rock Springs and Pine Hill is the deadliest highway in Wyoming. We still have those single car accidents. We, we know that there's significant trauma out in the Jonah and the Anacline. We try to pre you know, prevent those accidents from happening. However, you have workers who are working 12 to 18 hours a day. They, um, one example I, I bring forth in my interview is one individual came in at 3 o'clock in the morning he was unable to avoid, and, he, and I did his history. He drank a case and a half of Pepsi Cola a day. He started his day with two Red Bull. He smoked a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. He chewed a can of tobacco every third day, and he couldn't figure out why he couldn't empty his bladder. And I, I'm like, it's three o'clock in the morning, and I want to strangle him, but that's my job. I'm there to provide health care in Selma County. And I'm charging the district a lot of money to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning. So the issue is, is we have, we have a cultural lifestyle change where here we have an individual. He's out there. He's working. He's working in a very stressful, very toxic, noxious environment. Ozone levels, they're measured at 161 parts per billion, even though the OSHA guidelines are 200 parts per billion in that two-hour window where they might have to shut down. And we have all of these issues where... You're going. Why? You know. How do we? How do we control this? How can we control these issues that we're being presented with? <clears throat> the bittersweet. Okay, I'm trying to do this evaluation on this individual at three o'clock in the morning. Now tell me, are you doing methamphetamine? Any recreational drugs? Oh no, 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 no. And I'm like, well, you definitely have a nicotine addiction. You have a sugar addiction. You actually are. You know, you're so. I don't trust anyone. And so I look at that diagnostic urine specimen and look for recreational drug use. Well, he was also positive for methamphetamine and amphetamines. And I'm saying, you are going to die young. And if you don't die in a car accident, you're going to die from, you know, you know, he's going to kill himself with that many stimulants. So from one moment to the next, alcohol has always been an issue. And all the social issues that come with the alcohol, you have families living in trailer houses. You have people living in campgrounds. You have people that are living in the backseat of cars. It was the first time I saw homeless people that were renting storage units to stay through the winter months so that they could at least have a shelter and not, you know, have something over their head. So with all of the transition of workers coming in for all the jobs that are there, all of those social issues come with, you know, all of those other, you know, details. So back to the bittersweet, I'm making great money, <laughs> you know, but it's very hard and it makes my heart sad because this is no longer a small town. It is no longer my hometown. It's no longer an, a hometown where I can leave my keys in the car. I have to lock my door. And these guys have heard my spiel time and time again. But I live looking out at the, the Mesa Breaks, which is that view that you see on that pre-dawn photograph. And <clears throat> I live in my grandmother's house. However, I, I look out on that Mesa and one of my favorite meetings, or one of my favorite meetings, was a gentleman that <clears throat> there are three rigs on the Mocroft Ranch right across the river. And I asked this individual, I said, could you just put directional lights on the drilling rigs? He goes, why? And I said, well, I can read a book in my living room at nighttime. And he goes, well, close the curtain. And I said, are you going to buy me some? I've never had curtains on my window. At nighttime, every time there's fracking, my house vibrates, and then it stops. A few seconds later, the whole house just shakes as I live on the riverbed. I live on ball bearings. And I, once again, bittersweet. I no longer can hear the river in my backyard because of the noise, because of the traffic, because of this industry that is now in my backyard that used to be closed to winter traffic completely. So there's my bittersweet because, you know, I, I mean, in the interviews I talked about the rape and pillage of Selva County, 
And it truly is because we no longer have that sweet little community. It has changed and there's no going back. Bittersweet, I still have a great job. I have great challenging patients. We harvest limbs, lives, fingers, you know, that's part of the issue. But it makes my heart sad that it's all money, 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 money. And it makes it very sad to see those transitions in a small town that, you know, is no longer hometown America. So that's why we still can sit and have a cold beer. We can all look at it. But each of us remembers, you know, that time when we didn't have to close the gate to the ranch and put a chain around it so people did drive in your driveway looking for the road to get across the river to the end of line. And that's my bittersweet. Um, and it's, it's hard. But communities that, you know, we're willing to tell you, you know, do your homework and, you know, anticipate these problems. Because they're real and they're hard to treat. And they don't, there's no overnight cure for those. So thank you. End up long dialogue. At this point, we'd, we'd like to open it up to, uh, to the audience. I know we have some, I recognize a few faces. I know we have a mayor, a former mayor in this audience. And, and dealt with some of these things. I know we have a current legislator, I know we have a banker, I know we have people from different perspectives in this audience. So you know David I'll get up and say something. <laughs> <laughs> you introduce you yourself. I will. Okay. Because uh, I, I, I thank you for being the nurse because my children have been to that clinic. Uh, I'm Pete Illoway uh, and I'm a I'm a state legislator for, from Cheyenne, and I was in Pinedale in the 60s. So I understand what you're saying, bittersweet, because I knew Pat Dew and Roxy Dew and some of those folks and, and worked up in that country. Um, but, and the bittersweet is, and the students that are here in, at the university can say thank you because we've rebuilt most of this university. And it's because of what's happened in Sublette County. Uh, the buildings uh, here at the university, we've built, I don't know, $400 million worth of, of uh, schools throughout the state of Wyoming. I know exactly what you're saying in Bittersweet. Um, because your town would not have stayed that way whether that whether you would have had industry or not, you would have eventually grown because you ended up with Jackson. And the billionaires pushed millionaires out of Jackson. And the millionaires now are in Pinedale and Boulder. And, and so it wouldn't have stayed that way. But the bittersweet is that industry has taken over in some areas. Uh, but on the other hand, you say, thank goodness, because if you take a look at uh, what has been done in the state of Wyoming, we're not paying very high taxes. Thank goodness to Ultra and in Canada. And you, I don't know how come you say that in Canada isn't one of the biggest. Oh, I'm because sorry, I'm sorry. because I was, certainly I in Canada is one of the hugest out there just in the Jonah field. Uh, we've, we've made billionaires or millionaires. They have given back uh, to this state. And I'm thinking of McMurray for that one. Um, and they've certainly done that in Pinedale. They've done it. Casper, they've done it throughout the state. They've done it here at the University of Wyoming. So if you take a look at, we just happen to have this occur to us. Uh, if you go up to, uh, to Campbell County, we've got four to 500 million tons of coal moving out of that, that country. Uh, the state of Wyoming is blessed in one way. We don't have high taxes. Uh, we've tried to work very closely Industrial Siting Council, uh, the State DEQ, uh, and so forth. Uh, we in the legislature continue to work and try to make sure that things do happen correct. It's not easy. But I thank you all for coming down. It's been most interesting to listen. And as I say, yes, I was up there uh, in the 60s. So I do know uh, that it has changed. And you can change. You can turn left from my kids. <laughs> It just takes a little bit longer, but, but thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions because I do understand what, what you're talking about. And I did study a little sociology and when I went to Fort Collins for college. <laughs> so I, I kind of have an affinity for all of you. So, um, but it's, it's been most interesting and thank you for, thank you for sharing. Thank you, Pete. Anybody else? Any, uh... Yes.
Wayne Callan. I'm retired in science education from the University of Wyoming. I've been here in this city for about 35 years now. I've done a lot of workshops in Pinedale and Jackson. Been in every school district in the state many times. And uh, <clears throat> I go around the state and I talk about conservation. That's been my field since I landed here in 1975. <clears throat> Interesting to me is that we have an ozone problem in Pinedale. 1997, the BLM did their environmental impact statement and they decided that there would be one well per 80 acres and there would be about five square miles, five square miles of impact. Well, it was the Bush administration and they went to 40, a uh, well per 40 acres. And now it's way below that, and I would invite you to look at some of the photos of Jonah Field flying over it. You can't find a wildlife manager in Wyoming. I won't tell you it's an ecological disaster. Gone are the homes for wildlife, gone are the migration routes, Deer herd it used to attract hunters from all over the world. It's down to half. It didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to be that way at all. You could have kept it at one well per 80 acres, and you probably wouldn't have had an ozone problem. It's when you put all those hydrocarbons into the air and Put the sun on it and you get ozone. Same thing that happens in, same thing that happens in, same reason that happens, causes it in Los Angeles. But, uh, you know, what I, what I really see that we're really lacking here, somebody to represent wildlife, or a geologist who will represent the fact that we have hit the top on oil. We haven't, we've been going down in oil in this state since about 1997. We've hit peak oil. People that tell you that we haven't hit peak oil are the people in the oil industry. Because there's a doggone much money in it. If we hadn't peak, hit peak oil, why would we be 200 miles out into the ocean and drilling two miles deep and having the oil spills like we had by BP? Or why would we go, we'd be going into the Arctic? Why would we be going into the Arctic to take I was a roughneck in Alaska, and I, I was a roughneck in Cortez, Colorado when I was about 20 years old. I've been on the other side of it. We've got to conserve. We've got to conserve. Anybody else? Can I have just a minute? Well, and I'm not going to try and take on every point here, but let me start with kind of what my standard spiel is. Um, from my perspective, having grown up in Pinedale and now working for industry and seeing what's happening in Pinedale, um, I always tell people I'm a realist. Resources are being consumed by this society on a gargantuan scale, and all of those resources are produced somewhere and in someone's backyard whether it's coal or natural gas or a pig farm, so you can buy nicely wrapped pork in the grocery store, all of those resources come from somewhere and are in someone's backyard, and they never come for free. Um, there is a significant impact to drilling for oil and natural gas in Pinedale, Wyoming. That's why we did an EIS, which discloses to the community there will be significant impacts. Um, and it's not free. And there are air impacts, there are impacts to wildlife, and I would venture to say the industry has um, gone to extreme degrees to try and mitigate that impact, but it certainly doesn't make it go away. Um, and there's a price to be paid for the resources that we all want to consume, and that's um, that's one of them. And we continue on a daily basis to try and mitigate those impacts to do better. We've had multiple public meetings on the ozone issue in Pinedale. We realize there's obviously more to be done. 
um, whether it's a reduction of additional um, emission levels, whether it's trying to figure out, you know, we can take VOCs and NOx down to nothing and or the lowest levels we can, but maybe it's the ratio of those things. Uh, there's lots of work to be done. I'm not here to tell you there isn't. But I also think um, that we've done a good job of trying to mitigate those impacts and we'll continue to try and do a good job. But from a realistic perspective, those resources, when you got up this morning and took a hot shower and had hot water, they, they don't come for free. They come from someone's backyard. And currently they come from our backyard. Um, and soon they may come from Cheyenne's backyard. And my dad lives 25 miles north of Cheyenne and he calls me, this seismic company has called me. Um, so you know, it's coming, it's coming to someone else's backyard. Uh, there are positive things with growth. There are challenges and negative things with growth. Um, but from my perspective, having watched communities in Michigan die from lack of industry <coughs> and towns in Wyoming die, um, I would rather deal with the challenges of growth than the challenges of um, a declining <coughs> uh, economic base in our community. And it has, you know, that, so that's... I would, one of these, if you would explain it, one of the issues that we fought on were the, the open pits uh, next to the, the drilling rigs. And talk about the gas gathering. Because this, this is an issue that what we call the tree huggers would come in and say, well, the animals are getting stuck in the pits and the cows are getting in the pits. And how do you solve that? And I think that your company, I mean, the gas gathering changed because of that community awareness and because of some grassroots changes. And this well, is one example. Yeah, community awareness and community participation. I think people get very <coughs> jaded about the environmental process, whether it's NEPA or whatever. Um, and, and what do they get out of that? Well, we still have development. We didn't win. And I think in a lot of ways, people did win. Um, there are a lot of people on this end and a lot of people on this end. And we kind of usually end up in the middle. And, and so there's liquid gas, there's the liquid gathering system that came out of the, the other, the last SCIS, um, it, mostly in relation to impacts to wildlife and mule deer. Um, it was a suggestion that came from a game and fish employee <coughs> that maybe it's not so much the development, it's the traffic. Um, and the ongoing traffic for the next 40 years to haul liquids from these locations. So we no longer haul liquids via truck, we put them out, you know, via pipeline. This was a, you know, $80 million investment for, for my company, not to mention every other company, to put in a liquid gathering system. It, you know, I think um, it is an example of what happens, and I think there's room for all those opinions on the spectrum, and it, and it is an example of what happens when everybody um, comes to the table. And did we probably do more than if we had had a, you know, free reign out there? Yes. Um, which I think is a good thing. That, that's what NEPA, you know, that environmental process is all about. Um, did, did the other side of the coin get everything they wanted? No. Um, so it was a compromise, and I think it is on an ongoing daily basis, a compromise. And it, it is a difficult thing to see. I, I, just really quickly from Leslie's perspective, I went up 12 or 13 years ago when we staked the first well on top of the Mesa. And I always say to people, I can understand how if you spent your youth up there, whether you're um, Albert Summers or Leslie, who went riding up there and moved their cattle up there, that it is heartbreaking to look at it now. I mean, I can understand that. But for me, it's a reality of, of what we demand as a, as a society, um, this resource. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Like I say, the people need to speak out and their, their voices are heard because just like with the Mesa breaks, it is visually, a cha you know, there will be a visual change if you have a, you know, several rigs in several different places. People were adamant. They came to public meetings. They wrote letters. And we now have, you know, they will drill multiple rigs in different directions under one, you know, well pad that can move. And so you... Even if you look at that one in 80 acre spacing, that's been changed to one in 40 or now one in five acres. The impact, right, but that's downhole. I mean, and so because there, were, there was a lot of you know, concern, the drilling practices changed. So uh, it, 
it gets back to that bittersweet. They're not going to go away, but they'll improve the way that it's being done. And so those are those compromises that, um, you know, we butt heads, but we also have to compromise. And so th those compromises can be improved. Yeah. I was saying about doing something else today, and then decided against it. I'm going to bring it in at this point. Okay? We live in a democratic society, or at least a society with democratic pretenses, right? which means that people get to participate in some form or another, movements, city meetings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One of the binds that we have right, is, so, so how do we get to agreement? Right? So we get everybody around the table and they yell and scream, right? at each other and then eventually get to a compromise. But of course, one of the problems is that compromise is a local <coughs> compromise. I mean, here I'm thinking about an earlier episode in this whole business, the Green River Basin Advisory Committee meetings, which is an attempt to bring all these folks together. Um, and, and, and they got together and they had meetings and they argued with each other and they came up with some, some really good ideas. I mean, I think a very creative idea, one of the ideas they came up with was called eco-royalties, right? The notion that the, the companies, the energy companies, would be given money back from the federal mineral lease monies if they use state-of-the-art techniques in, in production, what have you. Environmentalists like that, industry like that, everybody like that, except the suits in Washington. Right? Went up, up the, the, the thing and, and the suits at the Department of Interior said, well, no, we can't do that. Right? And as near as I can tell, they never came up with a clear reason. My suspicion, of course, is the suits were saying, and pardon me, right. for those of you who are wearing suits, <laughs> um, I think it was a precedence issue. Right? I mean, if we let the, the oil companies get a kickback from federal money, then, well, the ranchers will be there wanting a kickback or whatever, and we're not going to have anything like that. But I want to suggest some. Well, the other thing is when you get people together to talk about this, okay, all you've got, it seems, is their views. Okay? I work for one company. This is my view. Somebody else works, is concerned about wildlife. That's their view. How do we know which view is going to dominate here? Okay. Something I've been working on, and I'm just going to do it very, very quickly, okay. is a confluence of physics, art, as a way to understand politics in a democratic society. The notion here is we have a tendency to assume that the game is about sorting truth or, or reality from fiction. Right? So this is real, this is fiction. So my concern about wildlife, that's real. Your concern <coughs> about money, that's fiction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Albert Einstein's theory of relativity in its most essential form says that reality is nothing but a relationship between an observer and the observed. Right? It's a measurement kind of thing. Right? Now he doesn't deny the existence of reality, but what he is suggesting is all we can see at any given moment is one piece of that reality. It turns out, as near as I can tell, completely unrelated, a fellow by the name of Picasso was playing with almost the same idea in terms of cubism in art. Some of his very bizarre paintings, right? What he's, he's doing is, is the same kind of thing. You paint a picture of somebody, a frontal, a profile, right? They're going to look different. And what Picasso was trying to do is capture the full reality. So what he does is he puts a frontal and a profile of the same person together. Right? We step back and we look at it, and it looks distorted. Right? But yet, in, in, in terms of reality, it captures reality more than either than, than a simply a frontal portrait or a profile. Make sense? Seems to me that's what democratic politics maybe <coughs> is about. Right? Right? is that what we've got out there is all sorts of different people observing the same reality from a different perspective. Okay? 
It's not a question of whose perspective is right or whose perspective is wrong. In fact, if, if that's the case, then all this stuff could be solved pretty easily. What makes it so dicey is the possibility that everybody's perspective is, in fact, true. Okay. Trying to put those together. There's a fancy term for all of this in the book. And, and, you know, it's horribly academic and you know, pretentious and whatever. And I wish I would have invented the term. It's called epistemic trauma. Epistemic trauma. What a great concept. But epistemic trauma is trying to capture this. And I think it applies to, uh, to, to politics in a democratic society. Right? If we get back and, and, and everybody who's sitting at the table, all they're doing is their perception of reality. And what creates the trauma is the possibility that all their perceptions might, in fact, be true. That also means you know, coming up with a simple solution is, well, not simple. <laughs> What I'd like to do is, is... George. Um, my name is George Parks. I live in Cheyenne. Um, most of my life in Wyoming, Cody, Casper, and, and now Cheyenne. Uh, 28 years in the oil and gas business, and Shell Oil Company was my first job coming out of college. Um, 40 years ago, the practices of the industry are remarkably different than they were 40 years ago. Uh, and and what my, my question to the folks on the panel, is anybody talking much about, about what things will be like in a longer time frame? Um, I had some exposure to Jonah 15 years ago. In, in your area is remarkably different than it was 15 years ago. My dad actually homesteaded at Cora about 90 years ago, but uh, it's remarkably different over that 15 year time frame. Is anybody talking much about what it might be, knowing what, if, if things don't change, the, about where the resource is and what it takes to develop it uh, from what you know now? Anybody talking about what will it be like in 15 years from now or 25 years from now uh, in terms of the number of drilling rigs, the number of frack jobs, the number of people actually working in the field, the, uh, you know, the traffic, and, and what the effect will be on, you know, on wildlife as well as on people. The comment that was made fairly early on is how, how much, how adaptable we are to, you know, to change and wildlife is very adaptive. We have urban wildlife in Wyoming that we didn't have when I was growing up because the deer, you know, the deer in particular have adapted very much. And I, I think it's helpful to think a little bit in a longer time frame. It doesn't mean that today's problem shouldn't be addressed with, you know, with all the energy that we can, but also keep in mind, um, and, and the gas, natural gas is, much less intrusive long term, I think, than the oil industry, than oil is. Uh, but even places where oil's been produced for, for decades, uh, people, people and wildlife have adapted and, the, and the, uh, the activities of the industry have changed as we get smarter and, and learn things. So I, I think that would be a, an interesting part of the discussion is looking with a little longer time frame. Of course, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a guessing game to some extent, but based on what we know now, what do you, what do you think it'll be like? So. Um, um, I'll just briefly make a comment. Some of the social movement organizations have actually commented on that. Technologically, the industry keeps improving, even since the boom initially in Pinedale, they're not now doing the open pits, et cetera. So that, they have kind of tried to frame that as the argument to slow things down a bit because when the resources are gone, they're gone. So they say, what's the rush? Uh, we can spread out the economic benefit, and hopefully as it's harvested later, we'll be using more environmentally friendly technology. So some of them have tried to spin it that way to argue for slowing down the pace, not stopping it, but just not putting so many wells at one time. Yeah, let's let our technology develop to where this is not so environmentally destructive, and we still have it there 
in the future to generate revenues for um, the state. People, I don't I know, know what the industry wanna, would say. Our <laughs> pineal panelists want to comment on that? Kelly, you want to be a seer? <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> We love it when people tell us to spend our money not so quickly. <laughs> um, that's a tough one. I mean, I think a lot of the progress that we've made on the technical, technological and, and um, the operational sides come because of the activity that we're doing. Um, I always tell people, you know, we're a company. We're business. Uh, we're making decisions every day about where we spend our money, um, what projects we spend our money on, and um, you know, the, the time, it's certainly not my area of expertise, but, but the whole time value of money and, and where you're spending money and where you're getting your resources now. I mean, um, it's, a, it's a favorite argument, I think, of people, well, why don't you do it slower and make it last longer, which is kind of counterintuitive to their whole environmental argument, which is do it as quickly as you can, get it done, get it replanted, and get out. So, you know, there's arguments to be made on both sides of that. The, the technological, let me just say real quick, developments have been astounding, even just for me. I've been in the industry for 13 or 14 years. When I came back to work at Ultra five years ago, uh, we were drilling wells in 60 or 70 days per well. A lot of those were straight holes. We've gone from a paradigm of 80 acre surface spacing to 160 acre surface spacing, so one well every quarter section, four well pads, I should say one well pad per quarter section, four well pads per section, up to 50 or 60 wells off of those individual pads, down to five or 10 acre spacing downhole, and we drill wells on average now in 14 days instead of 70 days. Uh, that's a change that's been made in the last five years. Uh, the technological advances, going pitless, doing the liquid gathering system, um, are astounding on a yearly basis, uh, not to mention over a 10-year span. And uh, I would say a lot of that is driven by the quality of the resource, the amount of gas that's there. You're looking at you know, changes on a daily basis, uh, between Jonah and the Anacline, probably the second, third, fourth, fifth largest natural <coughs> gas field in the United States. These are big, major resources uh, that allow us, because of their value, to do better, to spend more money on mitigation. I mean, in some ways, we're incredibly lucky that we have a resource that is able to carry a mitigation load like it does an investment in a liquid gathering system, the investment in pitless. And I know that doesn't make all the, the issues go away, but in many ways, uh, we're very lucky to have such a high quality, large resource in our backyard. Go ahead. I just want to add, uh, Mr. Parks hit on something very important, I think, and peripherally to the technology. If you, if you look back at how this happened, it was a technological breakthrough that enabled that gas to be accessed, as well as what's happened on national scale. You had, um, you know, September of 2011. So you had a movement to decrease your dependence of foreign oil. So you had a lot of political forces, technology came into play. And so going forward, as a school district, when we were looking at how we handle this influx of students, our elementary school population doubled in three years. You have to be flexible to account for that future that you don't know about. Um, an example is our elementary school is much like a, and it just opened this year, is much like an airplane terminal where you have wings that can be shut down if you shrink your population or you can expand and add more wings as a sudden population increases as well. So I think you hit on an important topic, which is what does the future hold and how do you plan for that? I think flexibility in, in your planning is key. So. I want to thank everybody for coming today. And particularly, I want to thank our panel for uh, working.